Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, we've got a great panel here. Uh, we've just been having a conversation uh, before we came here. We've got lots of diverse views um, about India, a country in transition, a country um, at the crossroads. Um, and uh, the people we've got on the, on the panel, uh, they've got uh, a lot of experience working in India, uh, observing uh, the changes that India is going through. Um, and obviously, the, the peg for, for this event is, uh, is this book that Oliver has written. And there are copies here if you're uh, interest, interested. Um, when I first uh, saw the book, um, I thought the title was a bit... Um, presumptive. <laughs> presumptive. Um, especially given the fact how the narrative of India has changed uh, in the last... Uh, year or so. Um, uh, uh, I was working in Washington for the BBC a couple of years ago, and I covered the U.S.-India nuclear deal very closely, looking at the, observing the debates that were going on in, in the Senate and the House. And there was, you know, this massive infatuation with India, and the money, and the, and the, and the potential for a strategic alliance. Um, and, you know, congressmen after congressmen would compete to show their love for India and the potential it had. But in the last two years that I've been covering South Asia at the BBC World Service, um, the narrative has, has shifted. Uh, the issue of corruption uh, is dominating. Uh, today we had the news of uh, the Indian economy um, growth slowing down to uh, five, mo slightly more than 5%. So, um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's <coughs> these kind of um, uh, bits coming out of India which are sort of uh, questioning the, the dominant narrative of incredible India. And we'll hear diverse views from our panelists. Um, on, my, uh, on my left uh, is Robert uh, Wallace, uh, a member of the uh, Panos uh, Photo Agency. He's worked in India, um, especially in the state of uh, Jharkhand. Um, and his, uh, his interest is uh, you know, social and economic change. Um, that India is going through, and we'll, we'll hear from him. Uh, next to him is uh, Abhik Sen, uh, Managing Editor for Business and Management Research at the Economist Group. Uh, he's, he used to work for the Asian Age newspaper uh, in Delhi. Um, on my right is Dr. Ruth uh, Katumuri, uh, Co-Director of the India Observatory and Asia Research Center at the London School of uh, Economics. Um, she's an optimist um, about India's future. Um, and next to her uh, is, the, uh, is the author of, uh, of the book, uh, Oliver Balch. Um, I have, uh, I'm still reading the book. I haven't finished it. Um, and as the title suggests, uh, it comes across as highly uh, optimistic. Uh, I'm sure there will be, um, you know, there will be some critical analysis later on. But I'll, I'll pass it on to you. We'll, we can kick off um, uh, about your impressions, your travels when you were writing the book. Um, each of the panelists have about 10 minutes. Um, so we can, we, I'm hoping to wrap up uh, in 45 minutes and then open up for question and answers. So over to you. Thank you. There, there's, there is an essential problem when you're um, writing a book that seeks to be very current. This book was uh, researched in 2010, written up during 2011, um, that events do change. And, and as today's news with in <coughs> India reporting growth 5.3%, substantially below the predicted 6.8%, then um, the title does seem presumptive, India rising. Um, someone said I should have put a, a question mark after the title. Um, but let me put it in context. The context is that I was revisiting India in 2010 after having been away for 15 years. I first went there as uh, an 18 year old to teach English up in a, a Tibetan monastery in, in Darjeeling, then traveled around uh, for six months at the end. That was in the mid 90s. And the story in the mid 90s was very different from the, the stories I was picking up from 2000 onwards, living uh, both in the UK and then afterwards in South America. Um, and so the, the, I guess the trajectory is, is longer that I take. And I, and I asked the question. I guess three questions. One is, is what's driving change in India? Who are the people that are driving change? What are the results of that change in, in terms of 
people's aspirations. And then where the book ends, what are some of the tensions with fast, not just economic change, but social and cultural change, um, which is where the, the shining India story becomes a whole lot less glossy. So the book opens with an experience in New Chennai, which is about 50 kilometers north of Chennai, in a place called Mahindra World City. This is one of these gated communities with uh, an export processing zone with BMW, um, some of the IT companies, as well as automotive companies and textile companies, um, a, a retail park, and then a residential area with these um, you know, gyms and uh, artificial lakes and uh, four-bedroom houses and what have you. And I'm standing there in the middle of this place having a corporate executive tell me about you know, the wonders of Mahindra World City, wondering who wants to live here, what kind of... Um, what kind of India, this new India we're hearing about, what, what's the nature of it? I mean, what are the aspirations that are bound up in that? Who are the people that will be living in this town? And who will be on the other side of the gate looking in from outside? Uh, and so it begins uh, trying to uh, interrogate who are these entrepreneurs that we're hearing about. Aravind uh, Adiga in his uh, book, The White Tiger, writes about the comparison with, with China and India that um, India might not have sewage systems and transport and electricity, but it does have entrepreneurs, which China doesn't. And actually, the contrast between the China story and the India story, India story I think, is really interesting. And some of the vested interests um, from the US and from the UK that India competes with China in the long term is certainly a, um, w would, would explain why your colleagues in Washington are, are keen that the India story keeps going, that narrative of India on the up. Um, uh, is maintained. The book opens then from this Mahindra World City to uh, to a meeting with uh, Captain Gopanath, who I I, I had been um, uh, put in touch with as the sort of classic Indian entrepreneur. Here's a man that was uh, in the in the army for many years, uh, left, went and took up his father's farm, which was the result of a resettlement. Uh, following a, a, a hydroelectric dam, they, they, their land had been transferred. It was almost, um, it, was, it was overgrown, um, and him and his assistant, assistant, him and his, uh, it, wasn't, it was an assistant, yeah, uh, converted this farm into a going concern. He became an expert in uh, uh, <coughs> production of, uh, of silk, um, and then he started, uh, he got a, uh, a small hotel in the nearby town, then he opened a, a motorcycle um, <coughs> subsidiary, then he eventually he bought himself a helicopter which he uh, <coughs> entirely on credit uh, and, and the ability to blag, then he got a second helicopter, then he set up something called Air Deccan that got bought out by Kingfisher that's not doing so very uh, well, he wasn't doing very well when he sold it. Uh, but he's a man that showed uh, great vision, great optimism and above all the willingness to, to look at a problem differently. Uh, and uh, I kind of tried to explore that in a bit of depth and work out whether that was uh, a, a general phenomenon in India or whether it was the exception of men like Captain Gopinath. I met this man called Naveen Tawari, who runs the biggest um, internet company in India, uh, sending out 55 billion web ads um, a month. He's about, he's in his early 30s. It was his late tw uh, 20s when he set up this company. He got funding through something called Mumbai Angels and Shirapo Ventures, which is one of the first uh, investors in Google. And they bet on this guy because he showed this ability to think outside the box for, you know, want of a better term. Uh, his grandmother was the first female professor at IIT in. Um, uh, in the north of India, I forget which one exactly, uh, Rampur. Um, Rampur's mm -hmm. got an IT, right? Mm -hmm. uh, his father was Dean. The Kanpur, maybe. Ka Sorry, Kanpur, Kanpur. 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 The assumption was that his, his father was Dean of the same IIT. The assumption was that he would go into academia. Um, and he, he broke with that assumption. He joined McKinsey, went to Harvard. He had the classic kind of story. His initial venture didn't work, but they bet on him, and it, and it all turned out rosy. I think uh, I came to the conclusion that those were the exceptions, actually. It, that said, exceptions run into millions, as we know in India. But um, there was a recent piece in the New York Times this month by um, 
Mohit Chandra, a senior executive at KPMG, complaining about the graduates that come out of the Indian business schools, that they don't show the ability to question authority, to think differently. Um, <clears throat> Um, which was a complaint you hear a lot from the foreign, the foreign business community particularly. Uh, <clears throat> but then it also looks at, at entrepreneurism at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, but beyond that, it asks this ability to, 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 to kind of question what your future might be. For the first time, I think, the, the, I guess the, 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 the core of the story is that for the first time, if you're the son of a carpenter who's the son of a carpenter, you don't necessarily have to be a carpenter. And that is a dramatic change. That's very normal in our, our Western mindset. But for, for Indian, Indian youth especially, and I think we'll talk about the demographic dividend later, but if Indian youth to have the, the chance to be something else, I think that's what the economic story has given. And that's really what the book begins to explore, how that aspiration is realized, whether it's in you know, buying your, your nano car, or whether it's in trying to become a sportsman against all the odds. And so I, I try and find these examples, whether it's from the, the kid that gave up his MBA to become an actor and you know, didn't manage it. This, uh, this willingness, I should say, to, to fail is, is, is a huge cultural shift in India, where you're pushed to pass the exams, to, to stick within the system. Um, and I try and pick up on, on some of that in the book. And then the book ends with some of the questions I think we'll be discussing, especially my colleague here in, from, from his work in Jark, and the people that are excluded from the New India story and why they're excluded and how they might be included. And perhaps we'll have an opportunity to talk about social, entrepreneur, social entrepreneurialism in, in, in India and some of the amazing examples there where people are using business to resolve social environmental key challenges that India faces. And I think the, the exclusion story is so clear in the case of the tribals. Um, and the, the book explores that um, and also asks some of the solutions and looks at the efforts that are being made in education to prepare people to succeed in the, the new India, give them the kind of skills and confidence that will enable them to take the opportunities that are there. Uh, but it, it, if, the, if the title is, 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 is optimistic, I think the, the book is realistic throughout. <coughs> it takes it takes us read that the Shining India story is, is a piece of marketing, uh, but yet it captures something about the, the zeitgeist in India. Even today, with the, even if India, um, and I'll finish here, even if India, I think, collapses, which I don't think it will, but perhaps if the, if the, if the economic um, slowdown that we're seeing today continues, there's been a mind shift in the country where young people see a different future for themselves. They are optimistic about the future. And that expresses itself in lots of different social, cultural, political ways. And I think that's the most exciting thing about India and why it merits the book India Rising rather than you know, an alternative that's perhaps not so optimistic. So hopefully that frames up something for our discussion about the challenges around transition change, about the, the, the economics going forward. Um, Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next is uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Katimuri. Um, some of the, the points that uh, obviously Oliver did not go into a, a lot of detail. Um, you, you know, the, the questions around uh, failures as well. I mean, there are stories of success, but maybe you can touch upon uh, both sides. <coughs> thank you, Shazen. Um, like Oliver, um, I'm not looking at India's growth perspective in the last two years or last five years. Um, I've lived in India before I came here. I spent two thirds of my life in India. So I'm looking at what's happened in India from a perspective of um, 40 years and also to the future. So I, you know, as a child growing up in India, you come across economic, political, as well as social issues, which were so different from what they are today. I'm not saying they're great today, but then I'm looking at what used to be in the 70s and the 80s, and then see what is happening now. So that's where, like Shazab said, my optimism comes from, and that's why I, my optimism will not be douched by what we see now. And in that context, um, like Oliver mentioned, in 2009, I had met, um, we'd met the Prime Minister, we'd done a presentation for the Prime Minister and the committee. And I was 
that was first time when, you know, in decades, I'd been extremely optimistic for India and said, India has the right kind of governance and leadership because there was the prime minister who was, um, he, who was very intelligent, wise man, and totally clean because these were issues you were aware of as a child about governance, you know, all these issues. So it was, that was one time I was really very happy to see the range of people governing the country. Kapil Sibyl, Montek Singh, um, who else was there, Kamal Nath. So it was a very strong leadership, intelligent, capable, and because the head was clean, you expected the other ministers to be clean as well. But then we all know what's happened in the last two years, like Shazik was saying, and that's when I remember to 2010 feeling a bit tired of what was going on. And this is when um, the phrase that came to my mind about India was that India is actually work in progress. So I wouldn't have used the phrase work in progress possibly in the 80s or even 70s because there was no progress in those days. However, I can use the phrase work in progress now and because progress is happening, but it is work in progress. So in that sense, I believe what it is going through now is, is part of that toward it getting to where it should be. And I think that is what's unique about India because the strength it has is its democracy. <coughs> And the challenge it has is also its democracy. Because it's a democratic nation, people can say what they want. People are heard for saying what they want. And that will also start <coughs> correcting things. And I'll take an example of, um, say, a one-child policy that India tried to introduce, Indira Gandhi tried to introduce um, in the 70s. She tried to enforce it on people. And what happened? People voted her out. And then the whole policy had to change, give itself a new name. And, and then it went, and what's happening now, the changes will happen gradually. Yes, it, it could exceed the population of China. Um, however, it's happening more gradually rather than in a coercive way. And that's what's very dynamic and interesting about India. That's why it is a land of contradiction. That is why it makes it a charming country. It makes it a very interesting country. But it's also, um, I think that's what um, the enthusiasm that you were mentioning uh, is also what makes it a very interesting country for the world. Now, the uh, the thing that India should be growing at eight nine percent, it's not. Uh, it has multiple reasons for that. It isn't. It's partly what is going on within the country, and I think of these things while they are very depressing to hear about. But I also think of the positive side of it as in it is essential, which means it's a good thing. People are beginning to speak about corruption. Ten years ago, I had a conversation with a young person, which means it's the top two, three percent of the population in this country who'd come to do PhD here. And <laughs> trying to convince young people that corruption was wrong was very hard ten years ago, because people didn't have the concept that corruption is a bad thing. The concept was everybody does it, so we do it. But today, the fact that people are voicing about corruption, the fact that people know that corruption is wrong, itself is progress, in my view. The fact that young people see that, it is itself an important thing. And the fact that these things are getting addressed is a good thing, because then the changes will come. Then the country can get rid of these things. Um, so these are, but meanwhile, it will go through this. So there are positive things, there are negative <coughs> things. It has to go through this process. Similarly, in the economy as well, because of what has been going on, the governance at the moment, the politics, um, and in a coalition government, it is always very complicated. All these issues come up, and then there is, um, but on the other hand, look at the positive side of it. If you look at the state elections, for example, the fact that people are now able to choose the government they want because the previous government did not do that. In the past, election was, it was dummy elections. People would carry people or just take truckloads of people to go vote for somebody who, who told them to vote for them. But today, Uttar Pradesh is throwing out Mayavati and selecting somebody who they think will govern their country well. So I think these are all important, important things. Now, what about the growth going down? What about the Bund? What about uh, the petroleum prices growing up? Um, it is tough, but what is the section of the population which, you, which needs petrol? They can afford to pay more than seven rupees. And it's also important in terms of environmental issues that some kind of regulation is done. And these things, you can't get it right all at the first time. So there would be some mistakes, there would be some learning, 
but there will be ups and downs. But I think this is all toward in the track that it should go. And the fact that people have a vo voice to say what they want, the fact that people have a voice to go and demonstrate in the streets, the fact that somebody like Anna Hazare, who's, who doesn't know much about governance, is able to um, you know, sort of influence certain things in the country. It, that's what makes India dynamic and very interesting. I'll stop here, and I think we'll get more in the discussions. OK. All right. Um, a big sin. Uh, you're up next. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to wish Oliver best of luck with the book called India Rising. Uh, you know, that's coming out at a time when things seem to be moving in the opposite direction. <laughs> Uh, we actually didn't decide to separate ourselves as right and left, but it looks like it just happened. <laughs> and, um, and just like Ruth, uh, you know, I um, spent most of my uh, early years in India, like, uh, you know, close to 30 years, and, um, and I think both of us probably grew up uh, in, in, in an India when um, there was just one god-awful TV station uh, instead of the zillion stations you have now that are still churning out rubbish 24-7. Uh, More rubbish. Uh, uh, but, you know, because my roots are there and I've spent so much time there and, uh, you know, I still go there all, all the time, my heart tells me, you know, that, you know, it's a place one should be optimistic about and, um, and, and that's what I hope for the country. Um, but when I uh, think with my head about uh, India, where it is today and where it's going, uh, you know, um, I am um, uh, far less optimistic, if not uh, downright skeptical about uh, its prospects. Uh, and not just purely from uh, an economic point of view. Uh, you know, it's 5.6% GDP today. It will probably bounce back to, you know, 8.9, maybe even, you know, reach that hallowed double-digit figure sometime soon. But, um, you know, there are some things that uh, are sort of going wrong on a more fundamental level with, with India. And it's, you know, and um, that's not to say that lots of good, positive, encouraging things are not happening. The examples and um, anecdotes that Oliver cited are, of course, part of the India story and, and uh, you know, uh, I don't know whether it comes from physics or chemistry, but for everything that is uh, true about India, the opposite is also true, as we know. And um, and so for every great entrepreneurial success story that Oliver uh, uh, has mentioned, probably written about in his book, uh, you know, there are thousands, if not millions, of uh, of uh, possible success stories that have been. Um, you know, stymied by all, all, all kinds of um, forces, um, you know, which are beyond the control of individuals. So like in the 1960s, I think, um, there was this American economist who went to Delhi as, a, as, a, as the U.S. ambassador, and he called India um, at that time. Uh, this is just about 10, 15 years after India um, managed to get rid of the Brits, uh, you know, after 200 years or so. And he called India a functioning anarchy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, uh, and uh, in many ways, you know, sort of 40 years later, it's uh, a, a description that probably still holds true, you know, depending on where you are coming from. Um, and, um, and similarly, another, uh, another little cliche about India that was coined around the same time by Naipaul, uh, you know, that sort of, uh, a million mutinies now uh, also holds true about India now because um, you know um, if you look at India uh, and dissect it uh, more closely either through the prism of caste or class or community you know um, uh, it is pretty much the case that uh, while somehow you know they found a way to cohabit you know, in in, in, in in sort of in a very broad sense, uh, within within that around the country, you know, um, there are um, there there is constant friction, there is constant struggle. I've just finished reading a book called um, uh, Marginalization. Uh, uh, sorry, what is it? Yeah, uh, trajectories of 
uh, marginalization, uh, which talks about in great detail the fate of Muslims in, uh, in Indian cities. Now, Mus there are more Muslims in India than in any other country apart from uh, Indonesia and Pakistan. And, and if you again sort of are looking for great feel-good examples, there are plenty in India. You know, India's biggest film star is Muslim. India's, uh, you know, India, India has had Muslim um, presidents in the past. Uh, there are uh, great uh, examples of Muslim businessmen uh, or entrepreneurs in India as well. So you can find examples all over. But if you look at the fate of Muslims uh, in India on the whole, particularly in cities, because that's where you find most of them, uh, you know, for historical reasons, um, it is uh, pretty abject and uh, and quite depressing. Uh, the way um, you know they're uh, not just their um, standing in the country, but their own sort of um, uh, view of, of of their prospects uh, in the country. So. Uh, so, you know, with everything to do with India, it's a question of uh, whether you're looking at it glass half full or glass half empty. And yes, there are great things to, um, to cheer, like, uh, you know, uh, this entrepreneurial spirit we talk about in India. Yeah, but, you know, it's not a spirit that, um, that sort of uh, has been plucked from Mars or something. You know, it is something uh, that uh, all Indians actually have to be just to get through um, daily life. I mean, you have to be an entrepreneur of sorts to get a gas connection or a phone connection. <laughs> you know, you have to be innovative and inventive to make sure that you know that uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, that that sort of uh, you'll you'll have food on your table the next day. Um, so there is a lot you can do with that kind of inventiveness, which you know the Western media um, uh, likes to um, kind of, um, I guess, glorify by calling it. Um, you know, I mean, there is a word for it in, 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 in Hindi called jugar, which is, uh, or probably even in Punjabi or Urdu, uh, which uh, sums it up nicely. It's, it's a form of, uh, you know, streetwise um, cunning, which most Indians uh, have to kind of deploy pretty much every minute of the day. Um, so that gets them uh, through uh, to some extent, and you know, and it is it is really the engine of a lot of things that happen in the country. But you can only get by with jugar or you know, or that kind of um, uh, street smartness uh, up to a point. Beyond that, you do need institutions to fuel a long-term secular macro story, uh, you know, which is, and those institutions include things like your education system, your health system, your judicial system. And um, if you look at any of those things in India at the moment, uh, you know, you will be hard pressed to uh, find too many reasons to be optimistic about them. I mean, you know, the health system, public health system uh, in particular is a shambles. You know, the education system, as you yourself alluded to in that, um, uh, article by the KPMG guy. You know, even the cream of Indian uh, graduates uh, leave a lot to be desired from an employer's point of view. Let's forget about uh, you know um, uh, all, all the problems it's storing up for for the country in in, in other respects. Um, and then you have this whole uh, you know the Brit British uh, gave India this uh, this great legacy: divide and rule. Uh, you know, and uh, and we somehow still ha haven't managed to um, to get rid of it because that divide and rule policy, you know, with the help of Jugar, has been uh, uh, refined into uh, you know into a, a, a weapon of mass destruction almost. So so you know, politicians of every hue, you know, as soon as they can um, get a sniff of power, you know, they deploy the same uh, policy. Uh, for their own ends, and so uh, whether it's um, governance, whether it's institutions, uh, and whether it's just generally like you know the uh, the will and morale of the people, you know they're all being tested uh, simultaneously. And yes, you know Indians by nature, I think, are an optimistic uh, people, but there are so many things that do not seem to be going in the wrong direction or in the right direction uh, that you know you can't help but feel uh, uh, a bit. Uh, 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 a bit skeptical about uh, the country's process. I hope uh, you know, sort of, uh, these worries prove to be, um, uh, uh, you know, slightly uh, beside the point. But at the moment, uh, yeah, and, and, and like I said, when I, you know, with, um, with my current work, I kind of also go to other countries that form uh, uh, 
that make up this acronym BRIC. So I was in Russia the uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, and yes, Russia has its own problems, but uh, there are certain things that you know Russia has uh, got right that India still hasn't got right. Uh, there are certain things that China has got right that India is a long way off from getting right. Not that we want to change, uh, you know, or rather swap. India and China wholesale for on all fronts, but uh, some basic fundamental building blocks, uh, you know, of, of nation building, which some of the other uh, countries in India's peer group seem to be getting uh, right. India is uh, still a long way off uh, from being there, uh, but all 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 the good things are 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 are, are also worth shouting about. So um, I'm kind of uh, sitting on the fence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I promise you, we did not premeditate this seating <laughs> arrangement. As you can see, we start from optimism to cautious optimism, skepticism, and probably downright <laughs> pessimism. So uh, much more. <laughs> uh, but the floor is yours, Robert. Uh, well, <coughs> my most recent experience working in India has been in the uh, state of Jharkhand, which is uh, central <coughs> India, uh, part of the mining belt that stretches across Arissa, Chattisgarh, Jharkhand, Andhra Pradesh, and a few other areas. And um, this an area that's being heavily mined um, by Indian multinationals primarily, um, whose names you probably know because some of them now own British corporations. Um, so yes, I'm coming from a different perspective and um, thinking ab about what Oliver was saying earlier about uh, Captain uh, Gopinath and his uh, problem with land. Um, you mentioned that he was displaced uh, um, due to his, he lost his family farm due to a dam being built, but somehow was able to get replacement land uh, somewhere. Um, this, this is um, an interesting um, exception for me because my experience in uh, the mining states is that uh, most of the uh, people who lose land due to a major industrial project never g get any land back. And uh, if they're lucky, they get a very uh, small uh, monetary compensation. But uh, these are mostly uh, agrarian uh, people who don't have um, other um, economic opportunities outside of farming. So once they've, they've lost the land, uh, there's really um, nothing uh, for them except to end up usually in a in a government resettlement camp and uh, the money they might have been given for compensation disappears within a few months if they've received anything at all so yeah it's I'm, I'm just curious uh, um, whether Mr. Uh, whether Captain Gopinov's um, cast might have a um, um, an explanation for you know wh why he was able to make this transition and uh, most of the uh, people where um, I was working are either uh, tribal groups uh, known as Adivasi, who um, are non-Hindu primarily, and uh, so they're outside, technically outside the caste system, but in fact um, have less rights or rights equivalent to Dalits or the, uh, um, in, the, in the caste uh, system. So, um, yeah, I think uh, basically uh, what, what's happening in the mining states is also happening in other parts of India, um, which is uh, uh, a land grab going on by uh, corporate India primarily um, to, um, to get ma land for mining, for um, special economic zones, for hydroelectric projects. And uh, the, uh, the result is that, uh, I mean, you, you're getting an increasing uh, wealth gap between rural and ur urban India. So if you look at the, the, um, the figures, you, have, you do have a new middle class of 300 million or so, which is uh, what the Shining India story is, is about. And you also have uh, the 100 richest uh, Indians, uh, 50 of whom are billionaires, who, whose net worth is about 25% of the entire GDP of India. But at the opposite end, you have about uh, 800 million uh, Indians, primarily r in rural India, who are living on less than a dollar a day. And uh, about half of them, perhaps 400 million, live on less than 50 cents a day, which is what the Indian government has officially decided is the um, official poverty level, 50 cents a day. So. Um, 
in, in central India, many of these people are, are tribal, but uh, they're all, all primarily either uh, tribal or um, lower caste groups that are at the um, experiencing the sharp end of of what uh, development in India is uh, the form is taking now, which is um, to primarily um, acquire land and um, and get the resources uh, for either for Indian industry or for export. So um, the the rights that um, technically they have are um, protected in, in the uh, especially tribal people have constitutional rights to to uh, their ancestral lands, which um, have been passed down through uh, generations, and they have deep connections to these lands, not only uh, as farmers, but also as um, uh, spiritual connections, uh, uh, because uh, they, they, they have uh, worship uh, nature and their ancestors, all of it which is tied specifically to the place they live. So when they when they lose this connection to the land, uh, for, when they're forcibly removed, they're not only losing their livelihood, but also um, uh, all connections with who they are as a people. So basically, I would I would argue that um, well, um, I think um, Aaron Dati Roy had a quote that uh, that the current in the Indian economy is not a trickle down economy, but a gusher up economy in the sense that um, the wealth at the top and even the, the new middle class is uh, dependent on the, um, the, um, the land grab that's going on across rural India. And I really, um, I don't think it's sustainable um, on a social level. Um, there's, uh, we haven't talked about it yet, but there is, there is a civil war in central India uh, that's uh, going on. Um, and uh, the Prime Minister has said that uh, one of the ways to deal with this, this war is to um, include everybody in the new development model so that you know there's not exclusion but the problem the problem with that is that uh, the um, the people who are being excluded uh, really don't fit into this new heavy industry based model of, of modern India exporting resources from the countryside to the cities or to China, for example. And uh, they don't really have a stake in the new economy. Very few of them have the ability, once they, they lose their land, to, to get employment in, a, in an SEZ or in a, in a steel mill even, because they, they don't have the skills. A, they're also discriminated against <coughs> because of their, their caste or their tribal status. So the chances of them being uh, easily integrated into uh, the, the new Indian economy, I think, are, are quite are quite uh, challenging. And then there's also the uh, the environmental um, unsustainability. I think of in, in terms of the long term impact on um, on India's environment and on the global environment of the um, heavily mining based um, extraction uh, industries that are that are taking over large swathes of rural India. So I'll, uh, I'll stop with that for the moment. And, um, and did you want to introduce your um, uh, little presentation yes. at this point? Can, uh, can I just, yes. <coughs> um, not correct, but just point out a few inaccuracies, I'm sorry, right. in, in that <coughs> assessment that, you know, that, you know, uh, that India's economic growth, I, uh, I completely agree that, you know, there is a sort of uh, the, a social <coughs> Um, churning going on uh, in, in all the places you visited, but India's economic growth uh, is really mostly about services, not about heavy industry, as you mentioned, or about land. Base. You know, India is almost uniquely among its peer group, mm -hmm. you know, um, has bypassed the mine or, or is bypassing manufacturing in the process of development and, you know, focusing or rather the resources have almost gone entirely gone to services. Uh, you know, a, as an engine of uh, economic growth. And, and when it comes to environmental degradation, yes, there's a huge amount of that. But when you compare, you know, India's uh, environmental pollution per capita mm -hmm. compared to the U.S., Absolutely. it bears no yeah. comparison. There's no so. argument there. But I, can I just respond to that? <coughs> so you're saying that uh, Bangalore-based high-tech is, uh, is a much uh, 
greater generator of wealth than well, than middle, than not just Bangalore. Yeah. I mean, or, just or, general I mean, services, in, which yes, includes yeah. not just IT yeah, but right. a whole sort of bunch of other things as well. But uh, so it's actually a problem for India that it doesn't do enough manufacturing. But also, let's, there's let's very carry little, on yeah. after we've seen yeah, the okay. the presentation. Right. So this is specifically about uh, the state of Jharkhand and about. Uh, uh, tribal communities living there who are uh, on the sort of cutting edge of, of primarily in Jharkhand it's coal mining but in other states uh, Arissa for example it's uh, bauxite and iron ore um, so it's it's a similar issue in, in uh, different different Indian states and it's about five minutes it's six minutes, six yes. minutes. and th there's a bit about the their their culture as well we can see very clearly that the people who are taking the brunt of development, who are not getting the benefits of development, are the tribal people, are the indigenous people. Right now you are looking at the cost of coal which is highly subsidized. It is the poor who subsidize the rich. Jharkhand is one of the richest states in this country as far as mineral, minerals are concerned. It's a very uh, paradoxical situation. Rich land, poor people. You know when uh, your brother or sister is uh, get married, that time uh, you prepare a wall to paint. Why we make uh, this plant and uh, bird and deer, elephant? Because we want them with us. You can see on the rock art deer, animals, and fish. When I talk to some of the older men, the only thing they cannot adjust with is that they are leaving behind their ancestors. Again and again they have said, we will leave our stones behind us. That is their ancestors. And this is the thing which I think is deepest to an animist people who 
have ancestor worship. The development uh, which began in India after independence was an act of ethnogenocide. So we started out with industrial development. We didn't start out with human development. We didn't start out with spiritual development. We didn't start out with national development. We started out with industrial development, heavily centralized control over river valleys, over vast forests over vast mineral-bearing areas where tribal people had been settled since the dawn of time. When you have open gas mining, you are constantly in need of land to expand your mines. Now, people are not willing to give up the land easily. So how do you get land? You allow these fires, you know, to spread. So then you can declare a certain area dangerous, get it evacuated and get the place for your mining. That is what actually is going on. So this coal is very, very valuable and these people are wasting it. About 40 million tons of coal has been burnt off. Can you imagine 40 million tons of coal, how much carbon dioxide it is spewed into the atmosphere? Can I just make some general comments and then we can open uh, open the floor for uh, question and answers. Um, in that documentary, um, I mean, obviously this is the activist view from the ground. Yes. Um, what would uh, Indian policymakers, industrialists say uh, to justify <laughs> development? I mean, after all, uh, you know, this must have created some employment and there has to be some benefits. Um, well, most of these uh, mining operations in central India are, are very highly industrialized, so there's very little employment for former farmers, um, who, most of, who are the people who had the land before the mines came. And most of the employment comes from people coming in from the outside who can <coughs> operate heavy machinery, for example. Um, but the only employment that results for the the people whose land it once was is usually the type of scavenging which you you just saw in these images where they may live on the periphery of a mine where they used to have their farms and uh, scavenge bits of coal from the edge of the mine which is technically illegal but they, it gives them uh, a, a way to survive in this harsh new environment. Now the government says uh, you know, that there are resettlement plans uh, that, there are, that the they, they never result in land for land, so it's never possible for them to, to restart the, uh, the former way of life they had. And many of them will end up either in um, uh, day laboring on, on road work, doing manual labor, or, or moving to cities, which is why you know, slums are, are constantly expanding. Mm. And uh, technically, as I said earlier, the, the, especially the tribal people do have constitutional rights to, to their ancestral lands that are protected, but it's the enforcement that is never followed through. And also the government can claim that uh, national interest uh, will trump any uh, rights that they might have in the Constitution so that they can 
Yeah. I mean, I ask because it's a good example. Uh, because as you know, land acquisition is a big issue uh, in India. Uh, and it's right across. I mean, if you look at West Bengal, the issue of um, POSCO plant. Yes, same. Um, $12 billion worth of investment by South Koreans on hold uh, because of dispute between the state and the center over uh, land acquisition, over uh, community rights, and so on. Um, because from foreign investors' point of view, India has huge potential. But it's issues like this which are now sort of putting people off. The bureaucracy, the corruption, uh, you know, the even after, uh, uh, even after you know the project has been approved, uh, you know, years later they're still struggling to get uh, approvals uh, and, and uh, environmental approvals and, and so on. Um, it, it struck me uh, when you talked about uh, dreams and nightmares uh, at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, having spent time in the U.S., you know, uh, when one hears a lot about the American dream and how it is sort of uh, marketed around the world. When you're living in the U.S., you realize that it is indeed a, you know, a nightmare. Not, not everybody gets to benefit from that American dream. And I think the, the comparison between India and, and the U.S. Is, is quite striking, that you, you hear about these uh, you know, islands of wealth in an ocean of poverty. You hear about these you know, extraordinary success stories of individuals, and yet, Majorities is not uh, benefiting uh, from the wealth that you know Indians have have created. Um, I, I will just stop there, but I think you know uh, what what's been said here has has um, uh, hopefully uh, raised a lot of questions in your mind. Um, if I could just uh, see hands, people who want to ask question. If you could introduce yourself uh, and uh, keep your question brief, then more people will get a chance to to participate. Yes. Hi. Sorry, there's a microphone there. Hello. We need one, but hello. Yeah, can you hear that? Uh, my name's Navdeep. I'm a, a filmmaker based in London, and uh, just to something that I'm Punjabi as well. My family are Punjabi, uh, even though I was UK born. And what amazes me, I never even realised until I was an adult that we had Aboriginals, our own native America. We're talking about America and comparison between India and America or Australia. We've got our own Aboriginals that the Brahmins and the trendy Indians and the Indian identity doesn't even recognize. It doesn't even have a caste, as you were saying, you know. And I, 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 it's just, it, it, it shocks me. And it, it's, it's uh, you know, really fundamental. And seeing that, again, brings all those emotions up. We've got our own Aboriginals to worry about. And, uh, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That, that's a brief point I want to make, just emotionally, from just seeing that then. Yeah. As an Indian, you know, as, as an Indian origin person, uh, yeah. there's not a question. There was just an utterance. Can I just pick up on that? I mean, um, having not having finished the book, um, did you come across people like these and uh, you know the people that the question yeah. is referring to? And, and what was your sense? How how are they reacting to this story of success and growth? There's a whole chapter on the the tribal issue, um, and it is a hidden issue. It's not discussed. It's not part of the Shining India story. And it, uh, what I would say is it hasn't changed. I mean, that's you could have run that film. 30 years ago. In fact, the book finishes with a filmmaker who's passionate about social justice and environmental justice, um, who's worked a lot with rural communities. But he got that from his father, who did a film about one tree that was left on a mountain in Jharkhand. That was 30 years ago. They denuded the rest. You would have, you would have had the same story, but this is much worse now. So uh, it's escalating, and, and, and that's the other side of the coin of, of the New India story, is that those that are they're excluded, getting more and more excluded, as they can't participate in the, in the model that you described. Um, so there's a whole chapter uh, that picks up on the problems of corruption, why the development programs that are directed towards the tribal communities aren't being realized. Um, um, it, it, it tries to ask um, the question of how you might integrate them into the New India story, whether they want to be integrated in, into it at all. I mean, my, my day job is writing on um, issues of uh, corporate accountability and sustainable business. I was on the phone today to Survival International, who, who work explicitly on, on, on the rights of indigenous people, talking about the dissonance between um, international policy and, and corporate rhetoric around indigenous rights and the reality on the ground. It's a very diff difficult question about how you integrate tribal people into an economy that requires a, a level of skills that they just don't have and, and, and arguably don't want. Um, 
And so, uh, I mean, it is an, it's definitely an issue I just It's not an easy, it's not an easy issue. And, and there's always going to be a negative side to, to the story. And I, and I think the book does that justice. I mean, it, it takes into account these, these problems, the flip side of, of, of globalization in India. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just, it's like, uh, I think I mentioned it at the outset that for everything that is true about India, the opposite is also true. And I'd just like to address the point you raised earlier. You know, it's not that India does not recognize these people. In fact, in the Constitution of India, which was written at the time of independence, you know, these people were given a special place in the Constitution, and in you know, in, and, and in government uh, for government jobs and all kinds of things, there are special quotas for people who are clubbed as uh, scheduled tribes and you know and democracy has uh, you know has also uh, over the years empowered uh, them to some extent maybe not to the extent that they should have been but in it's the very the alarms, so sorry what is that recognition either, you know it's like it's recognized on paper no they get they, 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 they no they they, they are, are they, they there are a certain uh, there is a certain percentage of jobs reserved within any uh, organization that has anything to do with the government for people from these communities so you know you as a as a Sikh uh, will will not be eligible to get one of those jobs because it's reserved for these guys and similarly you know uh, the state that you uh, shot this film in actually today has a, a government uh, run by tribal people the chief minister uh, of that province uh, is uh, a tribal so uh, you know it's it's not all doom and gloom um, for tribals either because democracy uh, in India has uh, you know has has given them a stake in the system you know they, the power of the ballot has brought a lot of these guys uh, to government it's it's just a travesty that once they are in government they end up a lot of them end up doing the same things as uh, you know as uh, as all the people who came before them so so the uh, in fact um, a, a recent former chief minister of this particular province is now rotting away in 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 prison uh, because he completely uh, looted sort of the you know the, the the revenue that was coming from the mining industry because you know he had his own hands in the till mm -hmm. uh, and, and so uh, so the problem is quite complex and it's not that sort of you know the people who are victims are are just victims you know they are sometimes the perpetrators as well so it's yeah, it's I a mean, complicated things system. are not as black and white could could I can move I on to to, to somebody can I else please? briefly yeah. just to the, to the two points you just made, I, I completely agree. Jharkhand was set up in, in the year 2000 specifically to give Adivasis more control over their, their lives. But as, as you also said, corruption set in at the top. So um, money, big money, has a powerful effect. But on, on the point of the quota system, again, you mentioned it's uh, government jobs, but the new economy, which is what we're really talking about today, is not really uh, based on a quota system. Private industry. Yep does not have to uh, but give, give jobs to Dalits or to Adivasis. Well, but in, 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 yeah. in, in the private sector, you know, they are, uh, you know, they are in the same league as pretty much everyone else. And we should not forget that pretty much everybody in India is in a, in a minority of some sort. You know, you could, so whether you're an Adivasi or whether you are, a, uh, you know, a, a, a Sikh or a Muslim or even a Hindu, you are a minority because you're not just a Hindu because you are a caste within a Hindu, which automatically makes you a minority. If you are from a certain province, it makes you a minority in, in, in the country at large, yeah. so you know, so there are uh, there are uh, you know, in, in one sense, everybody within India comes represent, comes from some minority. Um, sorry, uh, yes. Um, sorry, there's a microphone. There. So just Hi, my name's Sam. I'm a law student. Given that the constitution was mentioned, I was wondering um, anyone's thoughts, whether pessimist or optimist, um, on say the role of India's major social institutions, such as the Supreme Court, in respect of. Um, India's worst off having gone um, in my own studies at least from the position in the 70s and 80s where highly um, protecting social rights and highly progressive institution to the situation now where they're displacing people with almost a sense of glee and um, you'll have seen the recent took like a bad fort judgment where 60,000 people or so were displaced which is around the population of Maidenhead um, and so I, so I mean and going for cases where the, the poor have been described as pickpockets of land. So I was interested in your view as to the way in which it would seem a major institution for democracy and social change has to become very different and how that fits into the view of India of our the, respective The role panelists. of the Supreme Court. Indeed, yeah. The, the uh, well, either in itself or as a generalised case of Indian social institutions. I don't know 
Thanks. Specific case. But um, anybody the, wants the, to take uh, it? What I know that is that increasingly in corruption issues, in governance issues, the Supreme Court is becoming increasingly proactive in ensuring the right things are getting done. But I don't know specifically, I, I'm not aware of anything specifically in cases like this. So, but I think uh, it is a complex, like Oliver was saying, it's very complex. And it is, it is an issue of development because there are positive cases of people. I can give, if you take um, Ambedkar, he's from the Dalit community, but he went progress to having been the father of the constitution. Kya Narayanan was from the Dalit community. He became the president of India. And I was very impressed reading a story recently, which is actually on the BBC website, about a Dalit woman mm -hmm. who had a very difficult background, but now she's running a $100 million company in uh, you know, she, she went through a difficult time. She was in a village, but yeah. Those ex exceptions, yeah. obviously, they... But they, these you know, issues, they, they, every country will go through these issues. It's about how does it done, and it is, it, it is not, the right thing is not being done. I can take the example of the young people rioting in London, you know. Hmm. So this is another extreme. In a developed country, there is a whole section of the population which is getting left out and socially deprived. But so the whole world is in a complex situation, both developed and developing countries. And this is a serious thing. When there is development happening, you need skills. So they are getting left out. But there are quotas and reservations to give opportunities to people. The fact that they're not being that corruption, all that will happen. But I think creating awareness and people that the each community should have create some leadership which be, becomes their spokesperson to enable that these things happen it'll take time it takes more motivation it takes commitment it takes somebody to kind of push for it and legally legal system should be doing that more uh, there's, there's a questions coming up there did you want to respond to the supreme court question or something else well you know uh, i just yeah i mean in many ways india is currently being run by judicial writ, you know, so uh, because, uh, you know, governance is so weak, uh, you know, but it's also a result to some extent of, um, you know, identity politics kind of just uh, taking o over the, you know, the democratic uh, system, you know, what democracy has given is a voice to, you know, various communities, but it has also um, given rise to identity politics, which means that, you know, people from a, a politicians representing every community, they split the difference to win the vote, to win the election. So the most potent symbol of Dalit or say scheduled caste uh, identity at the moment is this former chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, a uh, lady called Maya. Mayawati. Yeah. Now Mayawati, you know, like in the, in the early uh, 90s, when she was still on, make, you know, on her way up, the greasy pole, and I was co covering um, local politics uh, in, uh, at that point. Um, you know, she, she was addressing uh, election rallies of the party faithful who came mostly from her own community, which is the scheduled caste or the untouchables or basically people at the bottom of the, the caste uh, system. And her, her rallying call or her war cry to her people was that um, it doesn't translate quite as well into English, but in, in, in Hindi, it was that so uh, a rough translation would be that, you know, I come from the, um, the cobbler caste, uh, I'm unmarried, and that's why I'm yours, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and that was enough to propel her into, uh, you know, into uh, political superstardom to some extent. Mm. Okay, question there. I'm just going to say, apart from the relativity of that. Apart from the relativity of, of despair, which doesn't even begin to be... We can't even think about. I mean, there are people here who can't leave their food uncovered from the moment they've cooked it to the moment they've eaten it. Otherwise, they get more coal dust in their stomach than they do food. And, and saying that everybody means a minority is just painting by numbers sociology, quite frankly. Uh, better said by somebody else than me in the recent issue of the Internationalist, Shoma Choudhury from Tehelka is saying, as one half of India tries to transform itself into an industrial consumer society, supping with big corporations, it's armed itself with a battery of laws that allow it to cannibalize the land of others. And this is your point about constitution, legally at gunpoint. But in the tribal areas, these legal weapons are not enough. The fifth schedule of the constitution, which forbids takeover of tribal land, stands in the way. The ruse to get the land and the minerals below them is to remove the tribal people. Sound logic for Operation Gunpoint, 
which is where Arundhati and yourself and others mm, will mm. come in. And there's a, there is a war. There are 72 armed struggles throughout India at the moment, ranging from, ranging from organized war in Assam and the Bodhanese army. I'm not standing up for all of them by any means. <laughs> I don't know. I just know there are 72. This one is a big one. And it's, it's as it says here, it's a ruse for, getting, for clearing these people eventually. Mm. They're inconvenient, like the masses of the poor in the Brazil, India, China. They're inconvenient. Yeah. Well, thanks for your comment. Uh, there was a hand here, and then we'll go in the back row over there. Oh, hello, my name is Vinita Mutu. I'm a volunteer at uh, a UK charity called Asian Foundation for Philanthropy. I'm going to move slightly away from Jharkhand for a minute. I have a question about what we started off with, which is India's growth slowing down to 5%. Um, what is India's government doing in terms of investing in human development? Mm, who is the question for, or who will take it? For, for, uh, um, Oliver? Oliver. Oliver. Um, well, good question. Um, do we know what they have to do? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, the education bill was passed when I was there in 2010. Um, First of April. First of April 2010. So starting right in the bottom, trying to ensure that every young Indian has access to primary education. So that's fundamental. As you work, as, as you work up through the system, it's increasingly um, being privatized, isn't it, with, with um, English medium schools and then the private tertiary education. The ITs, IMs are, are, are run by the state, but still very exclusive. One, one example that I, I came across of, um, of, of private sector investment in human development was Infosys that have these amazing campuses for their programmers. They're, they're actually getting UK graduates now to be trained in India and then they send them back here. Um, you know, arguably they're training a, a bunch of data monkeys as far as I could tell, but um, <clears throat> the kind of creativity, the kind of ingenuity, the kind of thinking outside the box, the kind of skills that young Indians are going to need. And, just to keep them employed, they're going to have to create 10 million jobs a year, I think is a, is a task that the state system at the moment is probably isn't up to. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Mary Holmes, and I'm a, a volunteer with a charity called Action Village India. Um, I'm really getting quite depressed. I mean, I don't feel optimistic at all. Um, if you look at history, pe people in, in the developed world left the land in absolute droves in the 19th century. Um, okay, there was somewhere else for them to go, and, you know, m maybe things have got better. But when you look at the numbers in India, I mean, we haven't talked about numbers at all. I'm sure there are lots of enterprising, nice people and all that. But, I mean, you know, there are, I don't know how many, 700 million people who live in the country, don't have much chance of getting another job, will migrate to, to cities uh, without very much um, hope there. And I mean, I'd like you to say something about those people and what's going to happen to them. I mean, you know, okay, primary education, but that's not really um, uh, getting people ready. And just one last thing. I went to a very moving talk the other day about the Irish potato famine. And one of the things they said there was that during that time, when we all look on it as something terrible, all sorts of well-off people were saying how lazy the poor were, how rotten their farming was, and it was so like modern times. That was the point he was making. Mm. Okay. Do you want to? Do you want to address it? <laughs> or, or not? No, well, I'm <coughs> always I mean, happy to take. It, you know, these are these are big questions. I mean, you know, with, with the narrative coming out of India about. You know, you know, India wanting to be a, a member of the Security Council, a, you know, a nuclear weapon country competing with China. Um, its ambition is high. Um, and, and yet there are these very real questions. The, the, just the numbers, which he's talking about, 700 or 800 million rural Indians. Um, it's very hard to see, as I said earlier, how that, that they can be integrated or even, uh, you know, a, a large... Let percentage me, of them can be um, integrated. Okay, let me talk about yes. this village where um, I've been involved only in the last round of the survey. And this is a very small village in Uttar Pradesh. And uh, when I mention the name of the village, people don't even know it. They will only talk about a village with the same name in um, Gujarat or Himachal, but won't even know it's there. This is by, near the district of Moradabad. And this study we've had 
previous, we've had data for the last 60 years over, uh, you know, every 10 years. <coughs> and we spent uh, eight months in this village. But what's amazing is to see that even in this remote village, it hasn't been left out by development. Things are happening. When some people like Jean Dress, I don't know, many of you may have heard about him. Um, he's been, that's why he's been pushing for things like um, right to food, right to employment, because these are the social um, protection sort of program schemes which are being brought out as rights. Um, and they take time getting implemented, and sometimes when they come in, for example, when Narega came in, Jean went the other way and was very angry because it was poor implementation. And now that's another big issue as well, because uh, Montek Singh Alwalia himself has recognized in the new of a 12 five year plan that these are all issues to be uh, to be addressed and are being referred to in the five year plan but he also makes a very important point that the big problem for india is implementation and you all mentioned it's great it's written out and that's true but we also know the problem is implementation and because the corruption exists at so many different levels so narega right you know the employment guarantee act it's the great you know it's the largest program in the world of providing minimum employment to people so even in this Palampur village, we actually saw evidence that has changed from the last study that people have mobile phones. And when you go into the village, it's really a, a very um, backward village. There isn't much happening there. But then the children are going to school. And it was very encouraging for us to see um, girls going together as a group, uh, cycling to school. And there is one, one interesting uh, character we try to look at. We look at some of the old studies. It's kind of um, shoe to foot, some, that kind of a ratio. And I have seen pictures of, uh, of children 20 years ago. And you see children bare feet. But then today, they all go to school. Yes, maybe there are only three teachers to teach four classes. And it's possible that they don't have consistent teachers every day. But but, on the, but these are challenges, because there are not enough teachers to teach in rural schools. But these things have to change. These things have to come in, and it, it, they will happen. So because even if the government is willing to pay, there are not enough teachers. That's a problem. But on the other hand, there is a school. It, it's not, it is a pakka building, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's a concrete building. And they have uh, children going there. They go for the food, but also they stay and they study something. And I did actually pick up somebody's notebook in the front and ask, can you read? And they are able to read <coughs> that as well. And so, um, and that for us is an interesting example of how the developments are happening even in the small village. Not enough. I'm not saying that's an ideal situation. It's not enough, but the fact is it's happening. And about jobs. Now, what's happened over the years is large families used to own large land. But over the years, when the family gets divided, it, the land becomes smaller. And then what's happening, is that the phenomenon of migration or outside jobs. And an interesting example of this village is people are not going off, migrating off to Delhi and having nothing to do with the village. But because there are opportunities in the nearest district, such as Muradabad, people are doing commute jobs, which means they're staying in the village, but they're able to go every day and work and come back home. So that way, the development is actually, and I'm talking here about Uttar Pradesh, not about Tamil Nadu or Andhra Pradesh, where some of these things have happened for more decades. Whereas, and, and for me, I, I think the example of Bihar for me is very fascinating. And there I take the example of governance issues. Now, Bihar, he, it had a very smart chief minister. I'm not saying Dalip Prasad Yadav is not smart. He was a very smart chief minister, but he did nothing for the state. But this particular chief minister, when there is strong leadership, you can turn a state around. And that's what's happening in Bihar, because I was there in February. And I could see, uh, OK, Patna is not uh, Delhi. But the changes are happening. And, and they're making new moves. They're trying to cooperate with neighbors. For example, this was N Nitish Kumar organizing a big international conference. And also, there is the thirst and hunger for intellectual understanding as well as wanting to be part of the development. And 
in a room of 2,000, in, in a hall with 2,000 people, it was filled with that hall. They're sitting there and listening to public policy, financial issues, because it had the governor speaking, it had Montek Singh Aluwalia speaking, it had, uh, so I think it is seeping down slowly, probably it should be faster, but it is seeping down. So I wouldn't want you to be depressed, I think. Can I just uh, maybe take one last question there, and then we'll try to wrap up. Yeah. <coughs> I've been uh, I've been listening to all of you, and thank you very much to bring another side of India that I don't know. I'm from Kandmal, is the poorest state in India, poorest district in India, where I have witnessed around 56,000 people driven out of their home. It was the largest attack on Christians in India, and it was not reported. And here, listening to you about Montek Singh Holwalia and uh, Supreme Court of India, I, I, I find it quite actually difficult for me to see that a DFID focused state like Orissa and Bihar, whom you are uh, citing, examples of good development, are going through far right movements, the rise of far right, are growing and they are actually pitting people against each other. The tribals are fighting against Dalits and the tribals who are fighting against multinational corporations like Vedanta and other corporations which are based in London. Nobody is talking about it. The rags to reach stories of Vedanta is always there in the financial uh, dailies here. Whereas, this is the guy who was actually one of the accused in the Bombay Stock Exchange scandal. And uh, the Home Minister, present Home Minister of our country was a shareholder of this company and was on the board of this company. The day he became Finance Minister, he resigned and then he, his wife is the lawyer of this company. Mm. And S.H. Kapadia, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, is a shareholder of this company. Uh, and his son, yes, Vedanta Resources. Mm. And his son is a, a, a lawyer for Ernst and Young. Mm. And that's why this Vodafone scandal was one of the major scandals where we said that there is a conflict of interest. How can a sitting ju Chief Justice of India will be on this case, which was a $10.9 billion scam. Mm. And talking about disparities and uh, disparities of information as well. The mm. local medias, they know everything. Mm. They know who is the chore. Mm. So it's a very interesting also uh, game that's going on in this country, in the world as well, mm. about how they are projecting India. Mm. The projection of India is a different projection. Mm. The grassroots are really uh, brimming with anger. Mm. I had been to Bellary this time, and I saw the uh, Reddy brothers. One was the uh, revenue minister, and another brother uh, was the uh, Ministry of Tourism. They were all looting the resources of that country. 3,000 truck owners and 3,000 trucks run by 3,000 drivers. So you can see that kind of you know, trust deficit in this country. Mm. That's why the Western Ghat Experts Panel Report, which actually talked about the environmental rape of the country in Goa, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu. That report is not released. Mm. It was written by Madhav Gadgil and others. And that report is not released. They are saying that it will create trust deficit in the country. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank What's you. your opinion about it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want to comment? Yeah, I not mind if we can all sum up. Um, can I just say, I mean, a, a lot of the issues which have been pointed out are, I mean, well, it boils down to the issue of uh, governance, whether you take corruption, bureaucracy, uh, and, and so on. Um, being, I mean, coming from Pakistan and looking at India, what gives me faith um, about you know, some of the points that have been mentioned here is I think uh, is the strong democratic tradition uh, in India. And yes, there are politicians who are corrupt with criminal backgrounds and so on, but the ability of the masses to change governments uh, you know, every four years, every five years, uh, that's where you, know, you have to put some faith that the system will correct itself, you know, good leadership will emerge. I mean, uh, Indian leaders, um, I think for the most part, you know, they have failed uh, uh, the potential, the masses uh, uh, of India. What gives me faith is, you know, little uh, success stories like earlier this year, India was declared polio free. This at a time, when Pakistan and Afghanistan have become sort of the last reservoirs of polio. Um, the Right to Information Act, which you talked about, which has empowered Indian citizens to, you know, to, to demand information. I mean, the constitutional right, which is being exercised 
and yes, there have been activists who have been attacked, threatened, uh, and that struggle is, is taking place. But if you have to place your faith somewhere, I mean, Oliver talks a lot about the, the capitalist streak uh, in, in Indians, you know, being able to, you know, you talked about Jugar, uh, to find solution, to keep moving ahead, to keep, to take risks. Um, I'm not sure that's unique to, uh, to uh, people in India. I mean, you know, people who are desperate people anywhere without a job will do something. Um, uh, to uh, you know, to take care of themselves and to develop and progress. Th that ambition, I'm not entirely sure, is, is is unique to India. But there are things that that should give us some some reason for optimism and um, and hope. Um, I'd like to th thank you very much for coming, for spending the uh, you know taking our time to be part of this discussion. I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, who have contributed uh, their views and their thoughts uh, in today's session. Um, and with that, I think we can, uh, we can call it a day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.